I'm Mimi Locke. I'm the executive director of Voice of Witness. We're a San Francisco-based non-profit oral history book series that focuses on human rights crises and social injustice issues. Okay. And how can oral history help uh, advance human rights around the world? I mean, it seems like such a, you know, they're long-form stories. Maybe you won't get as many people reading them as will watch a TV, or like a three-minute TV program about uh, human rights abuses. How does it help? Well, we're hoping that um, the kind of stories that we collect and the depth that we go, depth and detail that we go into, will offer a nuanced, uh, complex portrayal of some of the issues that people maybe will spend three minutes watching a TV clip about, and maybe they'll end up, hopefully, end up um, at Voice of the Witness and spending um, time with uh, a person and their life experience and their experience over the course of a long form narrative, and from that, hopefully, gain um, a more uh, nuanced and um, broad-ranging understanding of the issues at hand. Mm -hmm. Tell me about some of your books. Um, we have um, seven books in our series. Um, the first book was uh, Surviving Justice and it's a collection of narratives from American men and women who've been wrongfully convicted and exonerated. Um, we have a book on Katrina survivors, on the documented workers in the US. Uh, we have a book of displaced and abducted Sudanese. And um, our two most recent books are one, a collection from Zimbabwe and another from Burma. Hi, um, I'm Maggie Lemire. I'm an editor of Nowhere to Be Home, a narrative from survivors of Burma's military regime. And I'm Zoe West, Maggie's co-editor. Um, how did you two come to this project? Uh, or when I, actually, first, why don't you set up the book? What's it about? How many oral histories are there? So this is a collection of 22 life stories of people from Burma. And we compiled the book by traveling to uh, Thailand, Malaysia, Bangladesh, and also inside Burma and the US, all places where there are refugees, migrant workers, activists from Burma, um, and of course, inside it was a little bit more limited, but um, there are 22 life stories covering the human rights crisis in Burma and the ongoing issues that um, are affecting people within Burma and in the border regions. And could you read uh, maybe uh, one of those, ec or an excerpt from the book? Sure. So I'll read the introduction. This is, um, this is the story of La Min, who was taken off the streets at nine years old to become a child soldier. And um, he talks about, in the full story, he talks about fighting in Karen State, where there's an ongoing conflict with um, non-state armed groups and the government army. So he talked to us in Bangladesh, and he spent the whole night speaking to us because he knew he would have to return the next day to the tobacco farm where he worked, so this was his only chance to get his story out. So Maggie will just read a very short excerpt from the beginning of his story. I'd like to tell you the story of how I joined the army as a child. I was nine years old, and I was living in the Lang Baya Township in Rangoon Division. It was a school holiday on the full moon day in November, and we were making a picnic. At around 8 p.m., one of my friends and I went out to buy some chicken. At that moment, an army truck came and took us. When they pulled us into the back of the truck, I found there were six or seven soldiers inside. My friend and I thought they were killers, and I was worried. They made us lie down on the floor. There were no seats. And when I tried to shout, they covered my mouth with their hands. They said, you keep quiet. You have to come with us. My friend and I were afraid, but we didn't say anything to each other. I had heard from my parents that soldiers beat and arrested people in my village. I had also heard that soldiers shot people in the street, so I was afraid they might kill me. The drive felt very long, and I had no chance to run away. When the truck stopped, we got out, and I saw the army base. My friend and I had been brought to a Burmese army battalion in Rangoon Division. When we arrived at the army base, my friend and I were brought to separate cells. They were like prison cells, and they chained the doors shut. Now, uh, this story and a lot of other stories in the book are just so terrible and they're gripping and, and I as a reader really you know couldn't help but put myself in their shoes um, uh, what are you hoping people take away from reading this book 
we're impacting her bill half. One of the things that was really important to us in choosing the format of oral history was that these are full life stories. So while an excerpt like that is obviously very dramatic and very terrible, um, if you read the book, there are moments that are normal, happy, and very small moments in addition to these very big dramatic moments. And we think that's important in allowing people to maybe begin to understand and begin to relate to the people in the book as fellow human beings rather than victims in this faraway conflict. You know, I mean, it, it, the books are, I mean, I've read a couple of them now, um, are very interesting, just gripping stories. And presumably, you don't want people to just read the book, they say that was interesting, like they would with any novel, and put it away. How do you make sure that they turn that information into action? Well, obviously, there's only so much that we can um, predict or uh, control how someone's going to uh, respond to our books. But we're basically each single, uh, every single story that we include um, is chosen for one, the human rights issue that it illustrates, and secondly, the um, how compelling the story is as a whole. Um, and um, and we hope that with a no with a kind of novelist novelistic depth and of detail that we um, offer in these narratives and, um, and the way in which those human rights issues are being conveyed, that someone finishes a story having identified with the narrator and their experiences and feels compelled, maybe even outraged, um, to uh, learn more, engage with organizations that are doing um, uh, work um, in these fields, whether it's in terms of advocacy or direct service helping refugees, for example, um, we ultimately we just hope to engender greater awareness and um, and action, um, ideally at the end of the day. Yeah, um, and you're, you're partnering with different organizations to help make that happen, right? Educational organizations and advocacy. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me anything about this? Um, we launched an education program just this year, and the pilot phase of that program. Um, focused on, on, on creating a curricula for high school students um, through to college was a partnership with Facing History and Ourselves. Um, we're beginning to partner with organizations like um, Amnesty USA and Human Rights Watch so that our, um, our narratives can augment their campaigns um, and their advocacy work. Also, um, this Burma book uh, that we've just released was supported by the OSI, the Open Society Institute, who see the work as a valuable tool in, um, in their own external advocacy efforts.